the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and hid in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? Jesus' disciples answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains. Those are 
St. Paul's words in Romans 8, just prior to today's reading. It's quite an image. Mother Earth, all creation, groaning in labor. Paul ties this figurative language to the whole of creation and then moves to make it personal, connecting it to how, quote, we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait. Paul is not talking about waiting for a birthday present or a special gift from a parent or a friend. Paul is talking about waiting in our human weakness, waiting in the realities of what he names as the suffering of this present time and waiting, waiting for the fullness of redemption, the wholeness of God's full salvation. In the meantime, Paul reminds us of the work of the Spirit. The Spirit of God helps us, prays with us, prays for us when the world gets to the point that we do not even know how to pray or what to pray. God is for us, Paul declares and pushes to that powerful proclamation that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Start there. Start with the clear message that God is for you. That God loves you. God's love is a key starting point for theological reflection. We want the youngest among us to get that message. Dear child of God, you are loved. And two, God's love is an ending point for theological reflection. We want the person on the verge of dying to get that message. Dear child of God, you are loved. Between those two points, from the cradle to the grave, certainly we want to proclaim and hear the message you are loved. Just as certainly, between cradle and grave, we recognize that there is a world growing, groaning under viral pandemic. The viral pandemic of COVID-19, but also a viral pandemic of violence, a pandemic of job loss and economic insecurity and access to loans, a pandemic of injustices, related to things as basic to God-given human life as shelter from storm and access to clean water and daily bread, a pandemic of hatred and prejudice and racism, a pandemic of political dysfunction, a pandemic of melting ice glaciers, rising sea levels, swarming locusts on the African continent. The powers and the principalities and the pandemics seem arrayed against us, seem arrayed even against God. In the chaos of it all, amid the labor pains of a groaning world, Paul points us to the gift of hope. Hope is that jump into the unseen, the foray into the seemingly forgotten, seemingly God-forsaken territory. Hope is the voice praying to God amid the labor pains and groaning of all creation as we wait. Hope is perseverance on the path of discipleship. Hope is the planting of our feet on the ground and the spring into action even when that action looks like be still and wait upon the Lord. Hope is the recognition of God's no, God's almighty no, no to the powers and principalities and pandemics arrayed against God, and hope is the recognition of God's unending yes, God's overwhelming yes, yes to creation, yes to resurrection life, yes to God's people, yes to me, and yes to you. Who hopes for what is seen? St. Paul asks. 
He takes us into that realm beyond what is seen, beyond what our naked eye can behold, beyond the power of magnifying glasses and microscopes. Amid the waiting and hoping and restlessness, Jesus, our living hope, tells some parables. Five short parables from Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed, like yeast hidden in bread flour, like a treasure in a field, like a pearl of great value, like a net catching all kinds of fish. Parables, you likely know, function like metaphors or similes. They compare two different things, not in a literal way, but with figurative language, language that is designed to make us think, help us ponder and see in new ways. I invite you to consider these similes that I made up. Her love, her love seized him. Her love seized him like the blue lights of the state patrol flashing in the rearview mirror. Clearly, her love caught him off guard, surprised him. But does the simile intend this to be a good thing or a bad thing? Try this one. Her joyous laughter was like two-hour emergency root canal on Christmas morning. Is the intent to compare laughter with disruption or to the point to the joy of finding relief? One last one to consider. His love, his love is like a tidal wave of emotion. Now we generally think of a tidal wave as negative. So is this about the volatile nature of his love? Or is this just a provocative but positive way to show the immense love that floods all of those around him? Now let's take just a few steps with Jesus' parables that we heard to today. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast hidden in bread dough. Are these only about the size of the seed and the quantity of leaven? Big things come in little packages. A little leaven can make a whole lot of bread. Or is there more to these? In the biblical days of Jesus, mustard seeds were considered invasive. One did not just plant them anywhere in the garden. In fact, there were Jewish laws against planting them anywhere in the garden because the plant, the mustard plant, would simply take over. Maybe that's part of Jesus' point. Could Jesus be using a negative image to point us to the positive? Leaven was also a negative example. Notice in the parable I read, I used the word hid. That's the original Greek. The woman hid the yeast in the bread flour. Instead of saying she kneaded it into the dough, the Greek says she hid it. In the days when Matthew was writing about Jesus' parables, leaven was widely viewed as a corrupting agent. Speaking of corruption, what of this treasure in the field? The field is not owned by the guy who finds the treasure. Does he find what someone else has hidden and cover it back up and then go buy the field? Does Jesus intend for us to think of the kingdom of heaven as something like a shady business deal? I doubt it. But I do agree with some scholars who suggest 
Jesus does intend, he does intend to get us to think that the kingdom of heaven is something like a corrupting power. Yes, the kingdom of heaven is something like a corrupting power. And that's the beauty of the parables. They twist our thinking and thus open us to new insight, new teaching, new creation. These corrupt images dislodge some of our domesticated thinking about God. So Jesus asked the disciples, do you understand? And they say, yes. What is this God up to? What is this Jesus, our living hope, up to? What is he saying to us? The corrupting power of grace is at work in the world. It will provide a nesting place for those little ones, the homeless, those who, like Jesus, had no place to lay their heads. The corrupting power of grace is at work in this world. It will be like hidden yeast, leavening the world's ways until, with Isaiah, every valley is lifted up and every rough place is made plain. And with St. Paul, every knee bends and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. The corrupting power of grace is at work and it will surprise us, bless us beyond measurable values. Grace, Jesus might say in North Carolina, catches us like a North Carolina shrimper's dragnet. These parables from Jesus invite us to see. Where do you see God in your daily life? Could you ponder how the kingdom of heaven is like your morning coffee? Is like a good dental cleaning? Is like a kiss from a lover? Like a neighbor's kind word or like a tool of the trade you know, plumber's putty, a shop vac, a teacher's lesson plan, a baker's dozen cookies, a fire hose, a mother's hug. We are on this side, waiting in the pandemics. But there are parables to help us see. See the evidence before our eyes that we are loved and that God will fully restore creation. God's word will not return empty. God's purposes will not fail. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus because the kingdom of heaven is like a child born to us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.